get started with the clinical use of the Tandem and Ring applicator. So our learning objectives for today, recognize the operational process in developing a treatment plan for brachytherapy, perform HDR treatment planning for a variety of applicator types, in this case, Tandem and, and Ring, perform plan checks on HDR brachytherapy treatment plans. We'll talk a little bit about that towards, towards the end and then understand the uncertainties involved in HDR brachytherapy planning and delivery. So this is an outline of this presentation. So again, topic four, session 12, this is the clinical use of the tandem and ring applicator. So the outline follows the procedure from introducing the applicator in the clinic to pre-planning, insertion of the device, followed by any transport necessary for imaging, and then onto imaging, and then finally, after imaging, we come to the planning with the applicator reconstruction portion of the implant that includes the planning aims and the prescription. Once this is all complete, then it's just the quality assurance checks prior to initiating the treatment. So here are a few different types of tandem and ring applicators you might see. They're all very similar in their overall design with the intrauterine tube or the tandem. And then, so, here I'm pointing to the, the tandem, the intrauterine tube. And we have it labeled in the bottom left. And then we have the ring, which is actually two rings in a sense for, for most of the applicators, since you have the ring that contains the source path. So you can see that in the bottom right here. And then usually there's a plastic ring or a cap that snaps on top. And sometimes the applicators have do, two different size caps that you can add to the, to the ring. So most kits also have a rectal retractor. So that's shown down here, also here. And as it sounds, it helps dosimetry by pushing the rectum further posterior, thereby increasing the space between the source and the rectum and helping spare excess dose. There's some differences in the construction materials depending on the manufacturer of the kit. So in the top left figure, you can see a metal applicator with a plastic ring and the rectal retractor. This is the same, same kit as shown in the bottom right, just disassembled. Here are the different angles of the tandems. So we have the three different, different angles and then we have the, the rings and here's the rectal retractor and then fully assembled. Below that, down here in the bottom left, you can see this is a completely plastic applicator. So much of this depends on the manufacturer. However, some manufacturers also have multiple kits and some are source compatible. I'll talk about that in a second and some are MRI compatible. So much depends on your afterloader and also your plan for imaging or even sterilization, what, what the different applicators need for a sterilization process and what you have available. So as I said, you know, like Varian has multiple afterloader machines. And some of the applicators are, are only compatible with certain machines. So the, the kits can, can vary depending on the afterloader itself because of the size of the wire that the Iridium 192 source is attached to. And then some vary just, just in their, their construction, whether this would be CT or MRI compatible. So here are a few other types of tandem and ring applicators. So the top left is a split ring. So it's kind of a cross between a tandem and an ovoid and tandem and ring. So this might give an advantage for placement. And I'll talk about that in a few slides with the, the pros and cons of using a tandem and ring versus a tandem and ovoid. And then the other two applicators are rings for hybrid applications. Usually when the dosimetry from the tandem and ring isn't quite what's needed, and the implant needs to be supplemented with needles in order to help cover the HRCTV and spare the organs at risk. So the figure on the right has needles that run parallel to the tandem. So you can see that down here, the, the needles bend a little bit and then just run in parallel to the tandem. And the figure in the bottom left has both parallel and oblique needles. So you see the inner needles here are parallel to the tandem, similar to the figure on the right but then some of the more lateral needles are oblique, and this helps treat a wide treatment volume. So if your HRCTV is fairly wide, more wide than it is narrow or, or tall, then you can extend dose out to the, to the periphery. This slide shows the dosimetry from a tandem and ring applicator. 
it's very similar to that of the, the tandem and ovoid kit, since it's essentially the same geometry. The picture on the right shows a 3D image of the applicator and some normal structures. And so you can see we have the general, quote unquote, pear-shaped distribution, which is similar to our, our pear here on the left. And then in our 3D rendering, you can see the intrauterine tandem, it passes through the center of the ring, ring here in red, the tandem in the light blue. The bladder is located anterior to the applicators. The rectum is posterior down here. And then you can see the rectal retractor colored dark blue in the picture, and it's located between the applicator and the rectum, and it's post pushing the posterior vaginal wall down and away from the applicator itself, and it's adding space between the, the applicator and the rectum. So as I said, some of the pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages of the tandem and ring versus a tandem and ovoid. So advantages of the tandem and ring are that it can lead to better placement among patients with a narrowed proximal vagina or loss of vaginal fornices. The ring also offers almost 360 degree loading capability for source dwell positions, which can be beneficial in some cases to accommodate spread of disease around the vagina. The tandem and ring applicators are a fixed geometry applicator, so you can have standard or template library plans. However, the fixed geometry can also be a disadvantage since it can't be adapted to all patient anatomies and can be difficult to use or place them in some patients. Another disadvantage is the opposite of the advantage of the large ovoids. So large ovoids could be loaded greater than a ring to treat larger tumors with similar dose at the mucosal surface. But with a ring, it's a disadvantage that it can't be loaded as heavily to treat larger tumors or you'll get a much greater mucosal dose. So, so as I said, the, the fixed geometry you know, can, go, can go either way, and, and you do have a little bit more options. And as I said, the, the split ring kind of is a cross between the tandem and ovoid and the tandem and ring, so it, it's a little bit easier to place. In general, the, you have more flexibility placing the tandem and ovoids. Since the ring, you, you have to be able to accommodate getting, getting the ring in. Whereas with the ovoids, you can go, or the split ring, you can go one at a time and it makes the placement a little bit, a little bit easier. So it's critical to commission and test each applicator component prior to its clinical use. Ideally, you should characterize and test each component, component and then perform an end-to-end -end test. So it's, it's recommended that you do this with all the staff involved in the procedure so that everyone can get comfortable with the procedure and know what's gonna happen and then be able to respond to any issues that may arise during, during a patient treatment. So this includes the physician assembling the applicator, placing it in a phantom, or maybe just even placing it on the table, taking an imaging scan, transporting the applicator or the, the quote unquote patient to the treatment area, and then planning and delivering the treatment to the applicator. You can also discuss emergency procedures during this end-to-end -end test, during a, a debrief at the end of the treatment to make sure everyone knows their roles should there either be a medical emergency during the procedure or a radiation treatment emergency. And so remember with the ring applicators in particular, it's especially important to commission the ring since the source path can lead to some uncertainty and error in positioning. And that was discussed previously in, in session eight. So the insertion. So once we have our patient and maybe we've done some pre-planning to pick our appropriate applicator, we come to the procedure of inserting the device or devices in the patient. So in this case, it's our tandem and ring applicator. Again, much is the same as with the tandem and ovoid procedure. So the procedure can be done in hospital in an operating room. It can also be done in a procedure suite in an outpatient clinic. It can be performed using local anesthesia, conscious sedation, spinal anesthesia, general anesthesia, no anesthesia. Some physicians, they prefer to have a Smith sleeve placed by the surgeon so that it makes it easier for the applicator insertion. 
With this device, there's no need to find the os and dilate to accommodate the tandem. The sleeve is just sewn into place to hold the os open and the tandem can just slip inside. This reduces the time of the implant, also the need for anesthesia since the cervix is already dilated. The tandem is inserted as far into the uterus as possible. However, we don't want to perforate the fundus. If you do have a perforation and you see it on imaging, uh, you can still treat, but you just want to make sure that you're not loading any dwell positions outside of the uterus or past, past the fundus. The ring is then placed at the top of the vagina as close to the cervix as possible, right up against the external cervical os. And some people have in-room imaging. They do have access to this. So if you have ultrasound available, some use transrectal ultrasound or transabdominal ultrasound during the placement to help visualize the, the placement of the applicators, help them get the, the correct placement or, or prevent a perforation. Others might have fluoroscopy available. Use that during the insertion to help visualize the implant. And, or you might implant this in a room with, with CT or another imaging modality that you can use during the implant. So it's important to go over these with the physician, see what training they have, check that all the equipment's working, that it'll be available during the procedure, and that all the staff involved and they're properly trained in its use. Awesome. There's a question, if you don't mind, I'll just ask the question while we're going along. Yeah, um, Kobe's Kobe is asking, what can we use if we do not have a rectal retractor in our ring applicator? Great question. And I think I have it in the slide coming up, but packing. So just as you would with, with the tandem and the ovoids, you can use the, the sterile gauze, wet gauze, just the what, whatever you have, what you normally use for packing. And so it is... I will say it is more difficult to get the same separation and, this, and the same sparing with the packing as it is with the rectal retractor. The rectal retractor makes it very, very easy to push, to push the, the posterior vaginal wall away, but you can do it. You just have to pack a lot, but that's, that's something to see you know, on, your, on your first treatment. And when you see the, the imaging, you can see how much packing was used. And then you know, for subsequent treatments, you might decide well, that was, that was not enough. We need, you know, for subsequent fractions, the, the rectal dose, the sigmoid dose needs to decrease. So we need to add more packing or do a better job getting more packing in. But, but packing would be your, would be the analogous to the, to the rectal retractor. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, please, please interrupt me as we go along to cover the questions as we come to them. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. So again, we want to use the largest size ring that can be comfortably inserted in the patient. And the larger ring, it helps to push the dose lateral if it's needed to cover the target volume. And it helps push the, the rectum and bladder away from the, from the treatment area, again, again, if needed. All of these concepts, right, the, the space is really the, the key concept to sparing organs at risk. Right, so we're really trying to use that inverse square law and the dose fall off. So increasing our our distance really helps decrease those the dose received by those organs at risk. So in this case, like like we said, rectal retractor can can be used. If you do not have that, then you can use packing, just like the tandem and ovoid. Oh, and there it is at the bottom of the, the slide here. So if the rectal retractor isn't used, packing gauze can be used to push the rectum as far away as possible. Excuse me. So some other things to think about when starting a program can be decided on what bladder filling procedure should be used during the procedure. So will the bladder drain to gravity during the, the treatment or will it be filled to a certain quantity and clamped before imaging? And then you could do that again at the start of treatment to have better rep reproducibility. Do you wanna do some sort of contrast flush right before imaging so that you can help define the the edges of the bladder and see the bladder wall a little bit a little bit easier so those are all things that that you know should be discussed and and set up prior to treating the the first patient in the program and this is the same 
for use of packing and, and possibly rectal contrast as well. If you want to put contrast in the rectum to help delineate the, the rectal wall and the rectum. And then this should all be included as part of the standard operating procedure for your tandem and ring process. So we, we know that bladder and rectum filling can, can dramatically change the implant of a geometry. So thinking about how to address those and delineate those upfront with, with your, your workflow is, is really important. Okay, so patient transport. So I, it, I believe this was, this was discussed in session 11 uh, as well, but almost all of us will have to move the patient that we don't have a table where we're doing the, the implant, doing the imaging, and then treatment delivery all, all at once. So most all of us will have to move the patient. So the biggest key to patient transport is minimizing movement. Anytime a patient is moved, there's the possibility of the applicator moving to a different position in the patient. And this is particularly important after we've had our imaging. So you know, we're planning on that image. So any movement, any motion of the applicator inside the, inside the patient after we've imaged is, is a problem because then, you know, we, we're planning on where and how we're delivering this dose. And if we don't have, uh, or if it's moved, then, then we're, we're introducing error, right? So, Ideally, you know, is a, a situation where we insert an applicator on the imaging table, take the imaging, and then treat on that same table. But again, that's not really a practical situation for most people, most clinics, and workflow. So how are, what are some ways we can help minimize the movement? Packing, again, with, with that wet saline gauze helps. You pack it tightly, it helps hold everything in place. You can put additional padding around the applicator that sits outside of the patient, that can also help. And it also stops the applicator from rubbing on the patient's skin. Uh, don't use the base plate like you might use for a cylinder applicator with the little X, X here. It's more likely to pull the applicator out when moving the patient. So you do have to be very careful. If you do have a slide board or a hover mat, something like that, when moving the patient from bed to bed, you can, you can use that. And that's that. That helps. Personally, we've we've gone to almost like a, a stirrup type setup where we just take long pieces of gauze and we actually wrap that around the applicator, and then it it comes up over the patient's shoulders and and around their neck, and and then also around around their waist, and that helps stabilize the the applicator from from moving. If you're using MRI imaging, you also have to think about what you're using to stabilize the, the implant. So, right, you definitely can't, can't be using these, these metal objects or affixing it, affixing things like that. So that's when the, the packing and the stirrup or wrapping, wrapping something, you know, some people have like a modified underwear where, you know, they wear this, this underwear where it's kind of cut out right around where the, the implant comes out. And so that helps helps stabilize it as well. So those are all those are all options. And, you know, with a lot of these procedures, you know, going through the end-to-end -end tests, it, it helps find problems and or, or areas that need to be discussed a little bit more, and how things want to be researched. And you know, if you find that you don't have a perfect setup, or you're finding that that you know. It, it's not as stable as you want, you know, you can modify these procedures. You know, most, most clinics do have these learning curves and, you know, change their workflow, change their way that they do their implants based on, you know, the, their previous implants and what they've learned and what they can improve. And, and you know, thinking, thinking about all those things, thinking about what you have on hand or, you know, some things that you, you see in different, different pictures or research, you know, these are all, all things. And it's really good to have, have a discussion with, with the group and, and get input from everybody to see how, how you can minim, minimize the, the movement of the patient, minimize the movement of the applicator and, and help improve the overall process.
Thank you. So. There's another question, if you don't mind. Of I believe in the previous slide, Kobe is asking if is the ring applicator coupled as shown in the picture before insertion and how is the insertion and how is it done? How do you hold the device? I believe that's what they're asking. Great question as well. So let me go back several slides here. So the kits typically open into what you see here in the bottom right. So the kit is completely laid out and then you pick the length of the tandem. So the, the tandem lengths are different and the angles are different and as well as the angle of the ring. So in the kit, you would pick out the individual tandem, the ring, the size cap, and then the rectal retractor. And then you would insert those each one at a time. So typically you're gonna insert, you're gonna dilate the cervix, you're gonna insert the intrauterine tandem first, then you bring in the ring and then bring in the, the rectal retractor. And then all of these clamp together once, once you have them inserted. Because usually, you know, you're kind of fiddling around with the, the tandem and trying to, to move it around. It would be very difficult to, to insert everything all connected uh, initially. So you have you do have the flexibility of, of you know, the three inserted separately and then they all come in and then lock together with some sort of assembly like this. Here's a, the metal where these have been inserted and tightened down with these screws. And then here's the, the plastic assembly and you tighten down with these, these knobs on either side, rotate and lock this in place. So hopefully that answers, answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for it. Okay, so imaging. Imaging is very important and is mandatory. So you need to be able to see applicator position, the tumor, cervix, uterus, the bladder or the bladder balloon, and the rectum. And the imaging is needed in order to modify the, the standard plan, standard loading library plan to specific patient anatomy and optimized. So we need 3D imaging. CT is good. MRI is the best. And there'll be a session on, on imaging in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to talk a, a little bit a little bit more in detail about it. And ideally you want imaging for each fraction or, or insertion, that's, that's the recommendation. So historically, many modalities have been used to, to assess and stage patients with gynecological cancers, including direct visualization and digital examination, radiographs, barium enemas, skeletal surveys. Those are, those are all used in, in assessing and staging the patients. We know that using radiographs to guide external beam or brachytherapy is, is less than ideal because they really fail to show the tumor and, and reliance on bony anatomy alone is, is again, far from ideal. So our modern 3D imaging, such as computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging have become the, the go-to imaging techniques for external and brachytherapy treatments for gynecological cancers, while ultrasound is now starting to play a much, a much larger role. So again, there are a variety of imaging modalities that can aid in an implant. Fluoro and ultrasound can be used during the implant. Those are, those are a really nice tool if available to help during the implant. They can be used to confirm the location of the, the implant and help guide as you're placing the devices. However, we want our 3D volumetric imaging to visualize the implanted devices as well as surrounding tissue. So the CT is the most commonly used imaging modality as it's really prevalent in, in almost every department compared to MRI, but MRI has much, much better visualization and, and so you can delineate tissues a lot better. However, it's just, it's just not as readily available and it does take time. So whichever modality is used, scanning parameters should be optimized as part of the commissioning process at the beginning of a new brachytherapy program. So these optimized scanning parameters should be part of the radiation therapist's you know, standard operating procedure. If the patient is going to be imaged outside radiation oncology department, then they should be accompanied by someone from the department who can ensure that the proper scanning parameters are used. The worst would be if the patient leaves the department and then comes back and you have an image that you can't use because the, the image quality is poor or they didn't scan, you know, for, for
further enough inferior or inferior, something like that. And you can't see all of your, your applicator or all of your, your target organs at risk, something like that. So it's important during the image acquisition that any marker wires or dummy wires are placed correctly to ensure the proper reconstruction of the applicators. Again, that's why it's important that if it's outside of your department, that someone accompanies them so that you can make sure that these are these are placed properly. I've I've had many a time where, you know, I've I've seen a scan and the marker wire or dummy wire has was only placed, you know, halfway up the applicator. And it, and it's clear to clear to see that. So we really want to try to avoid that. So in addition to computed tomography on a dedicated scanner, it is possible to use cone beam CT from a treatment machine to image the patient. So, you know, it's important to use creativity and, and think outside the box with, with brachytherapy. You know, well, we- What we about, have... sorry, go ahead. No, please. There's a question if there is any disadvantage of using C-arm for imaging. No, I mean, well- other, other than you know, I think, I mean, I guess C arm in the sense of you're just you're just taking your like AP and laterals. It, it helps for like if you're doing it in the room during the insertion, but you're not going to get great definition of the anatomy, right? So you're not going to get the same same as you know a, a CT scan on your on your dedicated CT scanner or MRI, something like that. It, it definitely helps with with the insertion, but I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit in maybe the next slide or some with the, the digitization. So, so ideally if you had, if you had use it during the, during the implant and, and making sure that it's, it's placed correctly, but then your, your full volumetric imaging after. Oh, so, you know, two examples that, that I had, you know, from, from our clinic, we, we do have a dedicated CT scanner. We do have cone beam CT on on a linear accelerator, we've always, you know, the, the process was always to implant our patient in our HDR treatment room, and then they get moved to the CT scanner and then move back. We had a patient a little while ago that was too large to fit inside our CT scanner because, you know, the bore of the CT scanner is only, is only so wide, and they were also too heavy for the couch top of the, of the CT scanner. However, you know, we, we thought, well, we do have cone beam CT. Is there a way we could use that on our linear accelerator? And we could just leave her on a gurney. So we ended up moving the patient on the gurney to the linear accelerator. We made a fake, a fake plan so that we could do our imaging. And we just took an imaging scan, our cone beam CT, and then transferred that over into our Bracky treatment planning system, and we were able to, to treat her. Another time we had just inserted an applicator in a patient and, and it was literally when they just finished insertion that our CT scanner was, was scanning another, another patient for external beam and the x-ray tube went out. And so we said, we have this applicator that's inserted in a patient and we have no CT scanner. What are we going to do? And so again, we moved them to the, to the linear accelerator and we took a cone beam CT and the image quality isn't as great as, as a dedicated CT scanner, but it is possible and you can, you can do that. Okay. So there are two primary methods of applicator reconstruction, which I believe you've seen in, in previous talks. So there's direct reconstruction and also reconstruction from an applicator library. So direct reconstruction uses the digitization tools to directly digitize the applicator as seen on the image set. And with an applicator library, the planner can just overlay, use overlay tools to place a known applicator on top of the applicator seen on the image set. An advantage of the applicator library is that it's typically more It'll be more accurate, and it's a better represent representation of the source path. And this was shown by a paper out of the, I believe it was the group in Vienna by Helbust et al. But with proper commissioning, no matter which digitization method, the total error was, was still less than about 4%, and larger errors can be prevented, or, or sorry, larger errors can be present 
that can lead to those discrepancies, such as errors with the with the contours. So again, it's it's it is difficult to reconstruct a tandem and ring applicator using just 2D imaging. So if you are using, you know, C-arm to just take your, your orthogonal or your AP and lateral images, but it, but it is possible. However, if, if it is too challenging, you can, you can just revert and go back to a tandem and ovoid applicator. So if using a model, it's important you're using the correct model for the correct physical applicator that was inserted into the patient and then ensuring that the model and applicator are aligned and matched up. So most of these applicator libraries have, you know, a, a large library with different combinations. And so you want to really confirm what was inserted in the patient and make sure that's the, that's the correct one that you're pulling from the applicator library. And then making sure that it makes sense once you're, once you're aligning it up, you know, identifying the ring center, lining that up, and making sure that everything looks looks correct with what you've what you've inserted over your image. Uh, with a tandem and ovoid, it might be faster to manually reconstruct the applicator since it's a variable geometry, and the tandem and ovoids can vary in their positions. However, as we said, the tandem and ring it's a fixed geometry, so a model library might be a lot faster. However, you can still digitize it manually, and that's perfectly acceptable. However you do it, it's, it's crucial that the digitization matches the applicator in the imaging in order to prevent incorrect dosimetry. So if you do manually digitize the applicator, which is what I, I still personally do that for the procedures, just make sure it makes sense. Make sure you're looking at your axial images. Make sure you're going back and looking at sagittal images and then coronal images and then also looking at your 3D reconstruction. You know, very often you can, you can look and everything looks great in, you know, your axial view, and then you look at your sagittal view and you're like, whoa, that's not, that's not quite right. And, and again, you know, the, the 3D image does give you a really good idea of what, of what you've placed, especially as you get more complex geometries and, and more, more applicators if you, you know, do hybrid implants where you now you have your tandem and ovoid or tandem and ring plus some needles. It really helps to make sure that, you know, you're not digitizing the same needle, the same applicator, crisscrossing them, things like that. So the, the 3D visualization helps considerably. So pre-planning. I'm going to talk about two different interpretations of, of pre-planning. I think one is, one is truly pre-planning and the other basically is, is a library plan. So in the sense of a, a true, I think a true pre-plan is you know, when you have the, the patient come in or, or you're, you're, sorry, talking with the physician, talking with your, your team about how you're going to treat this patient. So I think that's a unique opportunity to connect with the physicians and have a conversation, you know, that demonstrates physicist technical knowledge on treatment planning and how that relates to the implant and ultimately dose delivery. You know, no matter, no matter how good of a planner someone is, it's not going to make up for a poor implant if you, you know, choose the wrong applicator or have an implant that's substandard. Then, then it's going to be next to impossible to get a good plan, and it might not even be, be reasonable to, to treat. So, you know, if a patient has, for example, a tumor with a wide lateral extension around the cervix, we know it's only feasible to treat really with, with needles. You're not going to be able to, to extend the dose super, super wide, especially if they have, you know, bladder and rectum, anterior and posterior, and, and very close. You, you, you would push a lot of dose into the bladder and rectum before you were able to treat the widest extent of the tumor. Or conversely, if you, you know, didn't treat the widest aspect of the tumor in order to spare the bladder and rectum and complications, then you're, you're leaving target that's not, that's not treated. So, you know, you, then you have the issue of, of recurrence and kind of what's, what's worse, you know, a recurrence or, or a complication. So, you know, in that sense, I, I think it's it's really important to to think about 
and, and discuss, you know, in this, this pre-planning what, what's appropriate for the patient, what, what they would be able to tolerate, what they'd be able to fit, how you could treat their, their tumor. And I think, you know, solutions don't have to be quite standard either. You know, I think there is, brachytherapy has traditionally been a very creative field in radiation oncology. You know, each of us has a lot of experience and technical knowledge through our education and experience. And, you know, we can come up with a lot of creative ways of treating a patient. So, you know, I, I think I think it's important to, to think about that and think about, you know, not necessarily being totally bound by the constraints of typical applicators. For example, if you have a needle, uh, but there isn't a hole where you need to get a needle. Maybe you can angle the needle from behind the template. You could also, you know, make a new hole where the where one needs to be. So, so I think you know, I encourage you to kind of embrace that that creativity to to figure out what's best for the patient and how you can do what's what's best for the patient. And then the other type of pre planning is is right, just having these these pre planned with a library plan. So as we said, that it is a fixed geometry. So, you know, if you have your four centimeter tandem and with, with you know, your, your certain sized ring, you can create a plan because, you know, the dose is just prescribed and normalized to our point A, which if we remember, it's two centimeters superior from the top of the ring and two centimeters lateral to the, to the tandem. Right, so two centimeters here, superior to the external cervical os, which should be lying right at the, the face of the ring, and then two centimeters lateral, so on, on either side. And again, it's in the plane of the, the tandem. And that was discussed more in session nine. So, you know, then we have these, these preset library plans, and we can use those. But remember, those aren't our final plans. We need to think about the patient's anatomy because this is just prescribing to a geometrical point, which is great, which is what we've used traditionally for, for decades. But now, since we have our 3D volumetric imaging, we have a much better idea of, of what our tolerance doses are and how we can help do better for the patient by sparing those, those organs. So again, prior to clinically, Implementing a tandem and ring applicator, it helps to determine a starting applicator loading pattern. So with our dwell positions and weights in the tandem and also in the ring. And these can be used in the treatment planning system as a starting point before optimizing the plan for the individual patient anatomy. But these are all dependent on the tandem length and the ring size. So you might have to come up with a, a library of you know, a lot of combinations, and that's a lot of work up front. But once that's done, it'll make it very easy down the road. Because again, you can just pull the applicator library and these library plans and use those as a starting point and then modify it for each patient's anatomy. So it is, it is work up front, but it does save in the, the long run. So as with the, the tandem and ovoid, there are two options for tandem loading evenly spaced dwell positions with different dwell weights. So the dwell weights in the top third of the tandem are one and a half times higher or dwell weights that are closer together at the tandem tip. And then the dwell weights are equal for each dwell position. So again, this sh should have been discussed in, in session 11, and then you want to normalize to 2.8, right? So these, these dwell weights, once you normalize it, it'll keep the weighting intact and that's how you'll get your pear shape and your prescription dose at, at point A. And then from that point, we can modify based on the patient's anatomy. There's another question. They're asking for, if you could remind us, the advantage of ring applicator to Fletcher. Yes. So again, so one of the, one of the biggest advantages is that it is a fixed geometry in that you can have these standardized plans. And, and plan library, but the fixed geometry is also a disadvantage because it doesn't really allow for variation in patient anatomy, right? So it can be, it can be harder to, to place. So some of the advantages, again, placement, better placement in patients with a narrow proximal vagina, 
or the loss of the vaginal fornices. You have greater optimization options with dwell positions available all around the ring, so almost 360 degrees. And then again, the fixed geometry with only the, the two channels. So those are the main, the main advantages and disadvantages. Thank you very much. The ring loading. So the standard loading in ring should mimic the ovoid loading. So right, the really the, the tandem and ovoid tandem and ring are basically the same applicators. We're, we're getting the same pear-shaped dose distribution. So we have the same number of dwell positions on the left and right side of the ring, same dwell weights for all ring dwell positions. And then recall from session eight that there may be a need for a dosimetry plan and a delivery plan to account for the dwell position offset around the ring. And again, it goes back to the commissioning and, and how, you know, how you've determined that your source path is in your ring and how you can minimize variation in that and, and reduce error. So remember, standard loading is not an optimized plan. So it's a starting point from where you can create an optimized plan. So the dose to the bladder and rectum have not been considered up until this point. This is just describing to a geometrical point in space, which is your two centimeters superior and lateral. And, and again, that, that's from historical data and how we, how we did it, but now we can do a much better job with our volumetric imaging. Because this point A, you know, when, once you look, might not even correlate to the, to the size of the, the cervix. So we might be able to, to pull this in quite a bit. We might need to extend it out if there's more lateral extension of, of disease. And then we have our bladder and rectum sitting anterior and posterior that we need to consider. Okay, so we're at our first poll question. All right. I can actually make you a co-host if you don't okay. mind. Okay. And now you should be able to see the polls in the bottom. Let's see if you can launch it. For some reason, I can. I had the same problem last time as well. Oh, perfect. I think so. Oh, perfect. Yes, we're good. Yeah, if you want to read the questions first, and then we can give everyone a couple minutes to. Great. Yeah. When creating a standard plan or loading for the tandem and ring style applicator, how do you mimic the dose from the ovoids in the ring? So A, do you fill the ring with all position possible dwell positions? B one dwell position on the left side of the ring and one dwell position on the right. C, four to six dwell positions on the left side of the ring and four to six dwell positions on the right with equal dwell weights. Or D, four to six dwell positions on the left side of the ring, four to six dwell positions on the right and with varying dwell weights. So we'll leave it open for, for a minute here. So, and if anyone has any issues with the poll, let me know in the chat, but everybody should be able to just click under answer and we will end the poll once we have about like 50% of the participants um, getting their answers in. All right, we have answers everywhere. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll in 10 seconds. Thank you everyone for participating. All right. If you don't mind ending the poll, unfortunately, I can't. That was good. We got 50% 50% participated right at our at our timer. So, the majority said answer C, 4 to 6 dwell positions on the left side of the ring, 4 to 6 dwell positions on the right side of the ring with equal dwell weights. And drum roll. The correct answer is C. Four to six dwell positions on the left and four to six on the right with equal dwell weights. So I'm going to go back a couple slides here and just go over it again. So ring loading. So again, the standard loading in the ring should mimic ovoid loading. So you have the same number of dwell positions on the left and the right side of the ring. So if you have four on the left, you're going to have four on the right. If you have five on the left, five on the right, six on the left, six on the right. So four to six dwell positions on either side, and then the same dwell weight for all the ring dwell positions. So basically, everything should be symmetric, right? You want to start with a perfectly symmetric ring. Positions and 
Okay, so, so once we have our plan and our standard plan and prescribed to or normalized to point A, then, then we want to look at our soft and hard constraints for our planning and OARs. So this is the same as the tandem and ovoid applicator, which was discussed in session 11. And you want to refer to the ICRU report 89 and also embrace two guidelines. So here we have our planning aims across the top. This is for our, our target given in terms of our D90 in, in EQD2. So this is taking into account our external beam plus BRACI and our total, total dose. So our planning aim, so again, our, our soft constraint was we would like this greater than 90 gray, but less than 95 gray total to the high-risk CTV. And our hard constraint is we need this to be greater than 85 gray. And then if we look at our OARs down here, so we're looking at our D2 CCs for our bladder, rectum, rectovaginal point, sigmoid, and then bowel. So we have our planning aims. So our soft constraints, ideally we would like these less than this value in the top row, and then our hard constraints down here in the, in the bottom row. So for example, our planning aim, ideally we would like our bladder 2cc dose to be less than 80 gray, but we definitely want it less than, less than 90 gray. So once we have that standard library plan normalized to our point A, then we're gonna come in, we're gonna have our contours in for our bladder, rectum, sigmoid, our, our rectovaginal point, and then we're going to adjust our doses, adjust our isodose lines, our dwell times, in order to maximize our coverage so that we're, we're getting our target coverage here while minimizing our dose and, and hitting our constraints down here for our organs at risk. We want to be looking and keeping track of, keeping track of, our, so our total reference air kerma. So this is our air kerma strength multiplied by the overall treatment time at the time of the treatment. This was discussed in session two. And the track should be recorded for each patient fraction for all cervix patients, both tandem novoid and tandem ring. So this should basically always be recorded. And it's recommended at ICRU report 89. And it, this can also be used as a sanity check that the plan is not too hot or cold compared to other plans. So the track really... It gives you an idea. It shouldn't really change between patients and, and fractions, so it should be pretty constant. So if if you go, you know, from from treatment to treatment, and and it's you know, it should be consistent. If it's widely variable, then then something else is is going on. You probably need to look at it a little bit more closely. So, poll question number two. Let me see if I can launch this one. All right. So. What doses should be recorded for a 3D-based treatment plan using tandem and ring applicators? A, sorry, I'm trying to move this so I can see it. A, point A, bladder reference point, rectovaginal reference point. B, HRCTV D90, point A, bladder reference point, rectovaginal reference point, bladder and rectum, two cc's, and point one cc. Choice C, HRCTV D90, bladder and rectum, D2 cc's and 0.1 cc, and choice D, HRCTV D90, sigmoid and bowel, D2 cc's and D1, 0.1 cc. That was a mouthful. All right, so I'll leave this open again for, for a minute, try to get at least half the group group in. Yes, please participate in the poll question. I believe this is our last poll question as well. Yes. Awesome. We're going to give it maybe another 30 seconds. I think I only have like three three slides after this. Three more slides. Yeah, we're, we're wrapping up. Awesome. I'm personally right. learning a lot, so I lost it in track of time. All right. Maybe we can end. Yeah, we have about 52% of the participants yeah. getting their answers in. Perfect. Great. So the far majority... Uh, about two thirds said choice B, the HRCTV, whoops, CTV D90 point A, bladder reference point, rectovaginal reference point, bladder and rectum. And you are correct. So those are the ones that we want to, to record for each 
each fraction, each patient. So optimization, I'm just going to refer back to session nine, the presentation by Dr. Primos Petrick for discussion of the optimization of dose using the intracavitary applicators. So again, it's really an iterative process, right? So you have your standard, standard loading pattern that we've talked about. It's normalized to point A. It's a geometrical point. So it's not taking into account our, our target or our organs at risk. So we're going to come back and look at how this, the, our pear-shaped standard dose distribution compares to our target and organs at risk, and we're going to adjust it. Then we're going to look at our dose symmetry and see how it meets those, those criteria that we just talked about, the, the D90, bladder, rectum, D2 cc's, 0.1 cc's, rectovaginal point. And then we might have to adjust it again. We might have, you know, underdose the target, overdose the OARs. And so we're going to adjust those a little bit and then come back and look at the dosimetry and back and forth. So it's really an iterative process. As you do that, you know, you, you don't want to make huge changes uh, at a time. You want to you want to make, you know, smallish changes and and go back and forth. And and it's really important once you start changing those whether you're using manual typing and and changing your dwell times, whether you're using a graphical optimization, just remember to to go back and look at not only your, your dwell times that they make sense, but also look at your isodose lines and make sure that those make sense and, and where, where they are and, and in your axial, sagittal, and coronal views. Plan quality checks. Ideally, independent check of the treatment plan should be done. So you can use a simple spreadsheet. There's also you know, a lot of software out there that, that people have, have written and have shared and commercial software that can all be used. For each plan, check that the correct applicator has been reconstructed, that it actually matches the applicator that was inserted in the patient. We discussed that. Remember, that's particularly important if you're using the, the library. And then we'll have the radiobiological EQD2 dose spreadsheet that'll be covered in the next section, or sorry, next session. So all of those, you want to want to double check. I know we're running a little over. Thank you for your time attention. So last two slides, you know, treatment delivery, you should do a timeout conducted, you know, right before each treatment at a minimum, check that you have the correct patient, check that it's the correct applicator that's been inserted as per the radiation oncologist. Correct treatment plan is loaded on the afterloader, correct fraction, correct source strength in the plan. Make sure that, that, you know, what was planned is actually what was getting delivered by the treatment console and the transfer tubes are connected to the correct channels on the applicator. The room's then cleared and ready for treatment. So this last picture, I just want to show just because you have two applicators, the tandem and the ring, it doesn't mean you have a quote-unquote simple implant, right? There's still a huge potential for mistake. We have just two connections coming out of the patient with the tandem being more posterior, the ring being more anterior, However, if you're unsure which is which, you have a 50% chance of connecting it correctly, and you're going to get a wildly different dose distribution and a medical error if you swap them and treat incorrectly. So, you know, this, this illustration is just trying to show that even though it, it seems like a pretty easy procedure, you really need to know your applicators, get familiar with them, and make sure you're 100% confident in your, in your plan. With that, thank you all so much for your time and attention. Thank you.